So we will get started. So today we're going to go on a tour of the nervous system. So I want you guys to keep uh, kind of in mind that throughout this lecture, we're going to go through a lot. And this lecture is intended to serve as context for the rest of the, the term that we go through. This is kind of just gross anatomy. And I don't want you guys to approach this lecture as a bunch of anatomical terms that you need to memorize. Uh, keep in mind that I've designed all of these PowerPoints to serve as study guides. So pay attention to the parts that I have like uh, underlined and highlighted. I will even point out like this is a brain region I want you guys to remember because it's involved in a ton of stuff. There are other brain regions that I'm going to tell you guys about just because it kind of helps with the context, but you guys don't need to just memorize all of those names and information. So today's lecture, like I mentioned earlier, is going to be kind of a tour of the whole nervous system. And we're going to start small. We're going to start in the microscopic world, which is probably going to be uh, a lot of review. I'm going to go through that kind of quickly because most of you have taken biopsych. Um, and we're going to work up from that microscopic layer to kind of the gross organization of the nervous system, how the nervous system is set up to collect that information and where that information flows from. And so when we're doing this, like I mentioned earlier, we're going to kind of look at it from the back to the top. We're going to see older structures involved with like physiological needs, and then we're going to work to higher cognitive functioning, like the cortex and things like that. Cool. So we're going to start in the microscopic world with looking at who the main players are, right? You guys probably know that the nervous system is made of neurons, right? There's lots of different kinds of neurons different shapes of neurons that allow for different types of information processing and different types of information signaling and passing along. And embedded in all of this, something that I really want you guys to put into context, when you think about the brain, you think about the brain as this, this big gelatinous collection of neurons, but there's actually just as many glia cells in the brain as there are neurons. And neur the glia are kind of the support system. Now, what I want you guys to really know about glia is that glia doesn't refer to a specific type of cell. Glia is a category of cells, okay? And that's what we're gonna look at on this next slide here, is getting into the glia first. So the glia, the category of glia is the type of cells that help to maintain nervous system function. So when we're talking about the nervous system in general, we're usually talking about the spread and passing of information, but that wouldn't be possible without these guys, right? There's four main types. I, I'm not expecting you to remember all four of them, but there are two that are extremely important to what we're gonna talk about when we get into fMRI because two of these glia cells make what we do in MRI extremely possible. <clears throat> so those are gonna be oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. And this is what I just hinted at earlier. This is also just kind of a really important piece that I want you guys to know, that there are a ton of glia cells in the brain and the brain wouldn't be able to do anything close to what it does without all of this supportive function. Cool. So first one we're going to talk about are the astrocytes. The astrocytes are the most abundant glial cell in the system, and these are the ones that are providing the most supportive function for the neurons. Um, there's actually a lot that's not understood yet about astrocytes. These are like a very heavily studied topic in molecular neuroscience right now. Um, the most important thing to our class is that astrocytes are heavily involved in blood flow. And something that we'll talk a lot about with fMRI and what we're able to do with MRI, MRI is not looking at the actual activity of neurons. It's looking at blood flow when we're talking about functional MRI. And blood flow is localized. That's the only way that we're able to actually use MRI to look at what regions were active. Because what happens in the brain is you have a bunch of neurons that are involved in some type of information processing. And while they're firing, they're using up their resources. And when they use up their resources, a signal gets sent to these astrocytes that says, we need more resources, send us more. And because of that, blood flow is very localized in the brain. And we'll bring that back up later. That's not like on this slide, but it's extremely important to our ability to study the brain with MRI is the fact that the blood doesn't just go everywhere. It goes to where resources are needed, and that's because of astrocytes. 
Uh, they're also involved in all these other things. These aren't things that I'm going to actually test you on, but it just kind of puts things into context. So they regulate the extracellular ion concentrations, which make it possible for neurons to fire action potentials. Uh, they're heavily involved in repairing damaged neurons and damaged vasculature. And then this, this last bulletin point was what I was kind of hinting at uh, in molecular neuroscience. They're actually finding out that these astrocytes have communicative abilities of themselves. They can actually pass signals along with calcium. So just like neurons are talking with each other, the astrocytes are talking with each other too. And we have like no idea how that kind of adds into the whole network property of what's going on. So something you'll get out of this class is that we know a lot more about the brain than we did 50 years ago, but we still don't know nearly enough. So the other ones that are extremely important are the oligodendrocytes. And these ones are the ones that are insulating the axons of the neurons. They have these projections that come out and wrap around the wiring of the neurons and insulate them, just like the insulation on a wire. It allows for electrical signals to be sent really fast and really efficiently. And this makes up the white matter in the brain. And as we'll show you later when we get kind of into the organization of the brain, white matter takes up a lot of real estate in the brain, the actual wiring that's going back and forth. Uh, there's a specific type of magnetic resonance imaging called the fusion imaging that allows us to actually take pictures of all of those wires and look at how all the different regions of the brain are connected to one another. And that wouldn't be possible unless these guys were providing us the pathway to do that. They're the ones that are giving us the coding that we're able to pick up on MRI. So really, really important for white matter, for electrical transmission, all of those kind of things. So these next two are ones that I don't need you guys to, to really memorize. These are more contextual, just to, to know what's going on. So the microglia are the phagocytes of the nervous system. So they're the ones that are uh, traveling around and picking up dead cells and looking for infectious agents. They're the cleanup system of the brain, making sure that there's no kind of bad agents messing things up. So really heavily involved in homeostasis in the nervous system in general. And they're also heavily involved in inflammation responses, which if you start getting into like Alzheimer's research and stuff like that, the inflammation response is really heavily tied to a lot of neurodegenerative uh, decline and functions like that. So these are heavily studied by a lot of molecular neurosciences that are looking at Alzheimer, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the last ones are the ependymal cells. And we'll get into, when we look at kind of the macroscopic view of the brain, we'll start talking about ventricles. That's what this big circle is here. Um, the ventricles are a protective system in the brain. They allow for like shock absorbance. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but the ependymal systems are the ones that are surrounding these ventricles and kind of creating that barrier and that capsule. And they're also heavily involved in the production and regulation of the cerebrospinal fluid that fills those ventricles. Uh, a lot of this deals with um, maintenance of like uh, resources and waste is done a lot through cerebrospinal fluid and the ventricles. So this is another one of the, the maintaining type properties of the nervous system. This other last bulletin point is kind of a new uh, direction with ependymal cells. They've discovered that some of these cells actually have stem cell-like properties and can aid in neuroregeneration. Neuro it wasn't until 30, 40 years ago that we actually found out that new neurons can actually be produced. So it was, it was believed for a long time that the neurons you were born with were the ones you had for your whole life, but there are very specific regions of the brain that are able to produce new neurons. And they're starting to think that these kind of play a role in that. So the main players of information transfer, as you guys have probably known, you've probably seen a figure like this like 15 times at this point, uh, are the neurons. And there's four main components, right? So you have the cell body here, the soma, that contains the nucleus, all the genetic material. Uh, this is where information transfer is kind of happening because the dendrites out here are the input of the cell. Those are what are actually receiving information. And as they receive information, 
you have this change in electrical potential that flows across the soma. And it gets to here at the axon hillock, which we'll talk about in a minute, which provides the action potential. And the action potential, the actual signal, is sent down the axon. This is what kind of a cell? Right here that's wrapping this axon in myelin? A ligand dendrocyte. Yep. So this white stuff that's surrounding the axon is the myelin. It allows for that electricity to flow efficiently and quickly. And then the actual transfer of information is happening at the synapse, right? So at the synapse, you have the presynaptic cell has these neurotransmitters that are released into the synaptic cleft. Those neurotransmitters bind to receptors on the postsynaptic cell. Those receptors, there's a lot of different kinds. Uh, some of them open pores that bring in ions. Some of them signal chemical cascades. This should be review for most of you. How a neuron works, kind of the overall structure of it. Um, this one I changed. Uh, you might have a different version on, on yours. Uh, the four main types are unipolar, pseudo-unipolar, bipolar, and multipolar. And this is just describing the shape of the actual neuron. Um, so the unipolar neurons are actually not found in vertebrates. These are ones that just have a cell body with one projection coming out, and they're usually found in insects to control muscles and glands. But we have pseudo-unipolar cells, which is what this guy is right here. So unipolar, bipolar just refers to how many projections are coming out of these cells. So you notice with this one that there's only one projection that comes out, and that projection then splits into the sensory version and the signal transfer version, the axon part over here. Um, we also have bipolar sensory neurons where there's just the sensory part comes out that way and the axon comes out that way. Uh, this isn't stuff I need you guys to memorize. This is just kind of contextual to show you that there's different ways that these neurons are collecting information. These first three are very simple types of neurons. These are very old evolutionarily. Uh, you see like in invertebrates, most of their cells, most of their neurons are bipolar. Uh, but when we talk about the ability to become more flexible, to handle different, more complex types of information, it requires multipolar connections, which means you have tons of dendrite projections. So this neuron is able to synapse to tons of different types of neurons, right? Some neurons will synapse to 10,000 other neurons. And this allows for a lot of flexibility, okay? So just, if you're gonna take anything from this, just know that like the sensory neurons are very simple and the neurons that are in the brain, the pyramidal cells, the motor neurons, those ones are a lot more complex. They have a lot more projections. And you're looking at, at that point, you're looking at summation of input, right? Because we're looking at trying to get this neuron to fire an action to and some of these dendrites might be going to inhibitory neurons, some of them might be going to excitatory neurons, and it's the culmination of all of those that determines whether or not this portion, the axon hillock, gets to the right voltage and fires the potential. So it's really, really complicated. And this is something that like, when we're looking at MRI, when we're, looking, like, we're not picking up this at all. Like MRI is looking at thousands of neurons at a time, and those thousands of neurons may have 10,000 connections on themselves. There's a lot of complexity built in here. Uh, and this is, again, some more kind of review. Just want to make sure you guys know what an action potential is. Uh, so the cell itself, when it's not firing an action potential, is at about negative 70 millivolts. And you have a presynaptic cell. I wish I had a picture of that. So we had it on this last one uh, right here. So you have the presynaptic cell. Let's say an action potential has been fired in this cell. The action potential has traveled down this axon, gone down to the axon terminals down here, and it's released neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. What will then happen is these neurotransmitters, they attach to these receptors and they start opening pores for ions to, to flow in. And it's sodium is what's driving the depolarization of cells usually. So you see in this graph here, that as the ion channels start to open, this dark black line is showing how much sodium is coming into the cell. And as sodium is coming into the cell, the cell is becoming more positive, right? Because sodium is a positive ion, 
And as the cell gets more and more positive, there's this specific spot here that has a voltage-gated channel. And if that voltage-gated channel gets to negative 55 millivolts, it will open up and it'll allow for a flood of sodium to start traveling down the axon and sending an action potential. And that's what you see here. You see this huge influx of sodium here. Once it gets to about negative 55 right here, this is when the ion channels at the, action, at the axon hillock start opening up and you get this huge flood going through. Uh, the electrical potential of the cell gets really, really positive, And then the sodium starts to just drain out of the cell. Now we have this refractory period. This red line is the action potential. So this is the electrical potential of the cell. So it gets really positive as the sodium comes in. And as the sodium starts to leave the cell, it starts to drop back down to its resting potential. But this dotted line here is showing the amount of potassium in the cell. And it actually takes a lot longer to pump the potassium out. And so we have this period where the cell actually dips below its resting potential and then builds its way back up. And during that refractory period, it's a lot harder to get that cell to fire again. So there's like a time limit. After a cell fires, there's a little while before it can fire again. And that puts constraints on the system. So this is stuff that I'm not necessarily going to test you on. It's context that I really want you guys to know when we start to think about how the brain works in general. This is something that I really do want you guys to know because this is something when we look at macro scale type studies of the brain, this is stuff that we're not necessarily able to pick up, but we need to know that it's going on. So an EPSP is an excitatory postsynaptic potential. So this means that the presynaptic cell released a neurotransmitter that made this neuron, the postsynaptic cell, more likely to fire. So that neurotransmitter that was released was a neurotransmitter that brought a positive ion into the cell, that made the cell more positive, more depolarized, more positive. And you'll see these little jumps right here are EPSPs, right? So this presynaptic cell released neurotransmitter that opened up ion channels in this one that made this cell more positive. You have this little jump. Now we talked about in this last slide right here, you have this axon hillock that needs to get to a very specific voltage. I'll go back to it. <laughs> I will. <laughs> this axon hillock needs to get to a very specific voltage in order to go. And so what you see here is that you have this little bump, but it didn't necessarily get high enough to send a potential. This is still an EPSP, even though the action potential wasn't fired. It's just this idea that the cell that's getting the information is getting more positive. IPSPs, on the other hand, are inhibitory. And that means that this presynaptic cell is releasing a neurotransmitter that's making it harder for this postsynaptic cell to fire. It's trying to suppress that cell, trying to keep it from firing. And in this case, hyperpolarization is happening. So depolarization is this idea that the cell is getting more positive. Hyperpolarization is this idea that the cell is getting more negative. And so this right here is an IPSP. The cell is getting more negative and further away from the voltage it needs to be at to send an action potential. This stuff is going on all over the brain. All of these signals are either inhibitory or excitatory. But what we're able to pick up with on our imaging techniques are just activity in general. It's really hard for us to distinguish which ones are inhibitory and which ones are excitatory. So you really got to keep that into context when we're thinking about what we're studying and what we're looking at. So EPSP, more positive, depolarization, IPSP, less positive, All right, more negative, and further away from firing an action potential. And the, the big takeaway that I want you guys to take from this is that the brain is not just this excitatory organ. It's not just constantly firing signals. There are systems in place that are suppressing firing in certain cases. This is what allows us to do things like attentional control, right? Cognitive control in general. We're suppressing signals from one area to exert control over it. All right. So we're going to get into neurotransmitters briefly, talk about a couple of them. I don't want you guys to memorize these different categories. The categories don't really matter. Um, there are very specific neurotransmitters we'll talk about here in a second. 
that are going to be important for things that we'll talk about uh, in the future in this class. Um, what I do want you to know is that acetylcholine is in a class of its own. Acetylcholine is a very specific neurotransmitter we'll talk about in a minute, um, but it is very different than the other neurotransmitters. And it's widely used in a lot of different animal systems. Um, and this is kind of a cool chart. If you guys want to kind of look through this on your own time, uh, it has links to different activities and different things. Uh, look at those things with a skeptical eye. Those aren't like proven for sure, but there's a lot of correlational evidence that shows that these neurotransmitters are heavily involved in these types of behaviors. So the first one, the first two that we'll talk about are the absolutely most important neurotransmitters in the entire nervous system, and that is glutamate and GABA. Glutamate and GABA are the stop and go neurotransmitters of the nervous system. Glutamate is the most prevalent in the nervous system, um, and it is the main excitatory neurotransmitter. So if it's an excitatory neurotransmitter, is it sending an EPSP or an IPSP? EPSP, it's an excitatory postsynaptic potential. So it's probably triggering ion channels that are bringing sodium into the cell, making the cell more positive, depolarizing that cell. Whereas GABA, on the other hand, is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's actually synthesized from glutamate. So it takes glutamate and breaks it down into a different type of form that it can then use for in inhibition. And so if this is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, what kind of postsynaptic potential? IPSP. Yep. And this means that it is hyperpolarizing the other cell. It is making that other cell more negative and less likely to fire an action potential. This is heavily uh, linked to chloride channels. Chloride is a negative ion, so it's making the cell more negative. So main thing I want you guys to take away from this is that glutamate means go and GABA means stop, right? And these are found everywhere in the brain. I mean, these are the main neuromodulation neurotransmitters in the brain. Other neurotransmitters tend to be a little bit more localized. This next one we're gonna talk about, acetylcholine is the one that I mentioned, is kind of in a class of its own. And that's because this is the most prevalent neurotransmitter in the peripheral nervous system, and it's heavily involved in the control of our muscles. So when acetylcholine is released, it's causing our muscle cells to activate and constrict. It's also involved in a lot of other neuromodulation type things in the brain. It's not just used for skeletal muscle control, but the main thing I want you guys to take away is that like, that is its main function. Um, there are drugs that will hit this. Nicotine is one that binds to acetylcholine receptors. Uh, and because of what we see about nicotine, what it does to us, we also see that that's something that acetylcholine is probably involved in as well. So things like arousal and attention, learning and memory, uh, there's a lot of evidence that it's involved in REM sleep. So there's probably a lot of acetylcholine receptors in the neurons that are involved in these different types of behaviors as well. And I mentioned that acetylcholine is something that's heavily involved in most animal systems and in muscular control in general. And because of that, a lot of animals have developed a way to utilize it for their own benefit. So most venomous toxins that cause paralysis are actually binding to acetylcholine receptors and they're preventing the acetylcholine from activating the muscles. And because of that, you have paralysis, the heart will stop and it'll kill the organism that the animal was trying to attack. So acetylcholine muscles. Dopamine is one that we will talk about near the end of the course when we get into cognitive control type stuff. Um, it's mainly produced in the adrenal glands. This is not something I expect you guys to memorize or know. Um, there's a couple different kind of localized spots that dopamine is produced. And these localized spots are actually heavily involved in Parkinson's because Parkinson's is a loss of dop dopaminergic tone. Um, the cells are not releasing the amount of dopamine that they should be. 
And so a lot of the times with Parkinson's, uh, you guys might have heard of L-DOPA. The, the drug that they take is actually mimicking the effects of dopamine. You'll see that people on L-DOPA will actually have uh, the tendency to exhibit addictive type behaviors because dopamine plays a huge role in reward sensitivity. So you have these Parkinson patients that can't move very well because dopamine is heavily involved in movement centers of the brain. But then you start amping up all their dopamine and now they're engaging in risky behaviors. They're engaging in uh, addictive type behaviors. So we see that dopamine has these, these various roles. The one that I really want you guys to know, though, is the, the reward sensitivity. Um, and this will come into effect when we start talking about cognitive control and motivation and things like that. It will come back up a lot. Dopamine reward system. Next one is serotonin. Uh, this one is largely produced in the raffinate nucleus. So like I said, GABA and glutamate tend to be kind of all over the place. Um, these other ones tend to have kind of specific areas of concentration. And what I really want you guys to know about serotonin is that it's heavily involved in the regulation of mood. So this will come up later when we start talking about emotion. This is a major target for uh, depressive disorders serotonin reuptake inhibitors. It's trying to balance out the, the serotonin tone in the, in the brain. Um, you'll see here it's also involved in muscle contraction, even though acetylcholine is the main one involved in that. But there's a lot of regulatory type things that serotonin is involved with, like temperature and appetite. Uh, there's a lot of sleep functions, like it's very heavily involved in dreaming and things like that. But Kind of one of the main targets, the main things that we've utilized it for is for mood type stuff. Uh, this is the last one we'll talk about. There's tons of neurotransmitters. These are the ones that are kind of the most prevalent, the most studied. Uh, neuroepinephrine is the main fight or flight neurotransmitter. This is the one that gets the body going, right? It prepares the body for action. Uh, do you guys know what the opposite of fight or flight is? Rest and digest, right? So this is trying to move the body away from rest and digest. And in order to do that, it has to increase the heart rate to move blood pressure to bring blood flow to the skeletal muscle because that's what's really important for fight or flight. And when we're not in fight or flight, we're kind of in that rest or digest mode where resources instead are being allocated to the stomach because digesting food takes a lot of energy. So that's this idea of moving blood flow from the GI tract. So if you're going to remember anything about norepinephrine, remember that it's heavily involved in this fight or flight response and getting the body ready for action. So to kind of put it into context, this is kind of the end of the microscopic portion of the lecture. And I hinted at this at the beginning of my lecture yesterday that these microscopic things are involved in these really, really complex systems, right? So even though there are these like local regions that serotonin is being produced in, it's actually being transported like all over the brain. So there's not just like these specific regions that are just like all serotonin or all dopamine. There's these systems that are traveling all over the place. And we <coughs> talked about 10,000 different dendrite connections. I'm talking about one neuron is receiving input from a lot of different types of neurotransmitters. We can see kind of at a macro scale that these systems are involved in specific types of behaviors, but the nuance at the microscopic level is a lot more complicated. And this kind of transitions us into starting to look at the nervous system from kind of a, a macroscopic level. Next step is to kind of take a look at gross organization at a macroscopic level. Most of the rest of this class is gonna be kind of at this level. Uh, we, all, we will look at some microscopic stuff when we start talking about sensory systems and how information is collected. Um, but a lot of the main topics in this course are looking kind of at a network scale of the brain. Um, so the nervous system itself is divided into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Uh, this should be somewhat of a review for you guys. Uh, this isn't something I'm going to necessarily test you on. Just know that the peripheral nervous system is the information collector. This is what's 
going out and reaching out to sensory systems, picking up signals, <coughs> and the central nervous system is kind of the, the control center. It's what's bringing information in and sending motor commands out. So brain and spinal cord, in the central nervous system, peripheral nerves in the peripheral nervous system. Yeah. So the autonomic nervous system, so this is transitioning, the rest of this lecture is gonna focus on central nervous system. And we kind of just got at this uh, when we were talking about neurotransmitters, and we've mentioned the two different types of action your body can be in. You're either moving and getting ready for action, or you're allocating resources in a different way, and you're trying to restore, you're trying to send food throughout the body, digest food. Um, and you'll notice that those two different actions are related to very different pathways of information. These are different nerves that are actually sending out different types of signals. Sympathetic branch is involved in the rest and digest, or I'm sorry, is involved in fight or flight. Parasympathetic is involved in rest and digest. And so the sympathetic branch, what do you think the main neurotransmitter is in the sympathetic branch? Neuroepinephrine, fight or flight getting the body ready for action. And these two branches are working against each other, right? It's like a, a teeter-totter. You're either getting ready to do stuff or you're not getting ready to do stuff. Um, there's more nuance to that, but it's kind of a simplistic view of it. So the way that the brain and the nervous system protect themselves, and I kind of hinted at this earlier, the first line of defense are these protective membranes that we call meninges. Uh, and this isn't something I need you guys to necessarily know. It's not really important for function, uh, but it's important to know why it organized itself in this way. So you'll see the very top layer, that kind of thick blue layer right under the skull is the dura mater. That's like the first protective sheet that the brain has. And then right under that, right under that is the subarachnoid layer. And it was actually called the arachnoid layer because it looks like spider webs. And this is where a lot of the vasculature is organized. You'll see up in here the veins and arteries are kind of flowing through this space, but it also gives this area of cushion for the brain as well. And then this green line right here is the pia matter. It's this really thin membrane that covers the outside of the brain. Um, this is distinguishable, distinguishable enough that you can actually separate the pia from the gray matter on an MRI image. So you can say like this is the very thin layer that separates the brain. And there's really cool algorithms that will just do that automatically. Uh, the other way that the brain protects itself is with these ventricles that we mentioned that are filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So it's this, this system of uh, holes in the brain that are filled with fluid and that gives some like give to the brain, right? It's a shock absorber but it's also heavily involved in maintenance. And that's something we mentioned when we were talking about those ependymal cells, is that uh, the ventricles and the cerebrospinal fluid can be utilized for uh, transporting nutrients and removing waste. Blood supply is extremely important. Like I mentioned when we talked about ast astrocytes, 20% uh, of the blood in your body is sent to the head. The brain needs a massive amount of energy. Um, it's not able to store its own glucose, and it can't extract energy on its own without oxygen. So there has to be this huge influx of oxygen whenever the neurons are using energy, and that's what allows us to be able to pick up the signal, the bold signal on functional imaging. It actually, like, overshoots, too. It gives the brain regions, like... 180% more than they actually need. It's uh, a lot of energy goes to the brain. And what I talked about earlier when we were talking about astrocytes, the only reason, and we'll get into this when we talk about methods next week, the only reason that MRI works is because of localized blood flow, right? If blood was going everywhere all the time, if it was just this like uniform thing where blood was just supplied kind of in this regular matter, we wouldn't be able to pick up on activity. Because what we're looking at when we look at functional MRI stuff is we're looking at localized blood flow. 
you have this region of the brain that responds to some type of stimulus, right? Let's say they're doing an attention task and they attend their eyes somewhere. The neurons that are controlling that attentional process are using resources, right? And when they use those resources, they send a signal to their astrocytes to say, I need more resources. And the blood is then supplied just to that region. And that allows us to pick up the bold response. And I'll tell you about what the bold response is and what we're looking at in a later lecture. But just know that blood flow is tightly coupled with metabolic demand. And metabolic demand is the need for more resources, right? So this one is really, really important. Um, and this is something that uh, really plays a role in the way that the whole organization of the system works. I remember when I first learned about the brain, I kind of just pictured the brain as this, like, this big glob of cells. But what you need to realize is that the actual cell bodies are organized in a very specific manner. They're either organized in nuclei, which are these balls of gray matter right here. This is kind of an older strategy in the brain of uh, information processing. Nuclei are usually located in these older phylogenetic structures. And there are these densely packed neurons that all share functionally similar inputs, right? And so if that nucleus is dealing with auditory information, that means most of the neurons in that region are all getting auditory inputs. If it's dealing with taste information, most of those neurons in that tightly packed ball of cells are receiving taste inputs. You'll see these a lot in the hindbrain structures and the thalamus. All of the, the kind of middle brain stuff are organized in these tightly packed balls of neurons. The cortex, on the other hand, is organized into layers. And so when I talked about this kind of belief that I had when I first started to study the brain, I always just pictured the brain as like this big collection of neurons. When you look at this picture, you see that the neurons themselves, the cell bodies, are all just this outer layer right here. And they're actually packed into specific layers that we'll kind of look at here in, in a little bit, uh, where each layer has a very specific function. Each layer has very specific inputs and outputs to different parts of the brain. This is what makes up, if you ever heard the term gray matter, it's called gray matter because it comes up as gray on an MRI image. And that'd be this outside little region. And then these are also gray matter because these are made up of cell bodies. The areas in between are the axons, right? And we talked about the axons being wrapped by oligodendrocytes in myelin. That myelin comes up white on MRI images, and it's all of this space in between. White matter takes up a ton of real estate. And that was kind of the shocking thing to me. It was just like I thought that the brain was just like all of these cells, but like the cells are all kind of packed to the end, and then all of this space in between is all the wiring in between them. So this kind of paints the picture of kind of the, the gross organization of how things are all kind of put in their place. Now we're going to go through kind of a, a tour of the brain. And this may go a little quickly. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here that I don't necessarily need you guys to know. This is just to kind of set the seat. These brain regions are going to come back up when we talk about other higher cognitive functions. But this is just going to kind of take a look from the bottom up. So what we're going to do, I showed you this picture quite a bit. This is what I was talking about when I talked about the phylogeny of the brain, right? That you have these older brain structures that are located deep and further back. So as we go through this tour of the brain, we're going to start down here, and we're going to work our way up in complexity. And we're going to see what kinds of functions developed as that went on. And a really good framework that I've kind of adapted as I've learned about the brain and learned about this flow of information is actually Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's, it's really interesting because when you look at the way that, that we kind of organize our motivations, is the same way that the brain had to organize its motivations, right? What it needs to deal with first is whether or not it's alive. 
needs to pump the heart, it needs to bring in air into the lungs and all these things. It needs to take care of really, really important physiological functions. And so because of that, these really important physiological functions are some of the oldest structures in the brain because those are the things that needed to be running for anything else to happen, right? And then as we move up, we start to get into things that are more involved with like fight or flight, making sure that the system is safe, that it's protecting itself. And as we get higher into kind of the higher cognitive processing, you'll notice that a lot of organisms are kind of only up to like this, this middle tier here. Mammals get into a lot of the, the social stuff. Mammals are very social creatures. Because of that, they have parts of the brain that allow them to do that. Um, these are like emotional processing centers. And then as we get to higher stuff, we end up with a lot higher cognitive functioning that the cortex allows us to do as humans, that gets to the self-actualization type stuff. I mean, this is very like um, out of the box. Like the, the brain is not, does not know that it's self-actualizing or whatever. But this is just a good framework to kind of think about how the brain is organized, right? It's organized in what are the motivational needs that need to be met for us to then do the next step. So what we're gonna start with first is the spinal cord, kind of the gateway of information. Uh, in order for the brain to do anything, it has to be able to collect information about where the system's at, right? So the nervous system, or the spinal cord is involved with uh, sensory and motor transport, right? So it brings all of the sensory signals in and it's the pathway for all the motor signals to go out. And this is just kind of an interesting point, uh, not necessarily something I would test you on or anything like that. Uh, the way that reflexes work, there are certain types of motor commands that need to happen in very quick timing, right? Like if something's biting you or if something's attacking you, you don't wanna wait for that signal to go all the way to the brain, be processed and then come all the way back down. And so there's actually sensory neurons that are linked to motor neurons directly in the spinal cord. And so it will trigger an action response without having to be processed by the brain. And that's how reflexes work. So those reflexes are never processed at the higher level in the brain. This is something that Sherrington studied. That's who we talked about in our last lecture. Um, and he noticed that the speed of it was not as fast as it should have been. So we'll look at, once you get above the spinal cord is when you start to get into the brain itself. And the first section of the brain is the brain stem that's composed of the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. And so this is kind of the, the low end of the pyramid, right? This is what should be controlling a lot of the physiological function and getting up into like the safety type stuff. So the medulla, the medulla oblongata, uh, <laughs> Gators are sad because I got all them teeth and no toothbrush. <laughs> so the medulla controls respiration and heart rate. So this is the, that very first part of, of the pyramid, right? So this is what needs to control a lot of the physiological functioning, pumping the heart, uh, bringing in air to the lungs, making sure the body's fed, right? It's also a relay station because this is the first portion of the spinal cord coming into the brain. So it has a lot of input from different sensory regions. But its main function, if you lose your medulla, you're done. Uh, next one is the pons. This is the one right above it. It's Latin for bridge. This is actually the bridge to the cerebellum. Um, it's really heavily tied to uh, eye movement. And so we're kind of moving up from the physiological needs, which the medulla takes care of a lot of. There are other regions that do a lot of physiological stuff. but. This one's starting to get into that safety aspect, right? Eye <clears throat> movements are incredibly important for safety. We need to attend to things that are important for our survival. And so there are projections here that don't need to be processed by higher cognitive regions that will automatically attend your eye to important things. Um, it's been linked to, to REM sleep and to getting the body into those rhythms. Uh, that's more kind of the molecular side of things. Um, but this next portion, the midbrain, uh, gets into some of those responses to the stimuli that the pons is picking up, right? So the pons is attending us to these uh, frightful things, and the midbrain is what's determining whether or not that's something we need to act on. So this is where a lot of the fight or flight signals are coming from. Um, 
processing anxiety and fear. Uh, there, are, there are higher cognitive regions that also process fear and anxiety and emotions like that. But this is kind of that first step. And when you think about these older brain regions, think about simpler organisms that are using these things, right? Um, they don't have really complex representations of anxiety or fear. They use those things for very specific motivational purposes, right? And behind the midbrain, this is what was called the old brain. Cerebellum is extremely understudied and not very well understood. Uh, it contains 69 billion of the 89 billion neurons in our brain. That is massive. Like three fourths of our neurons are located in the cerebellum and we have no idea what the hell it does. Uh, it's really tied to um, body position, fine motor control. So if you play an instrument, it's this idea that it's taking motor commands and it's adding nuance to them. It's allowing for very fine control over motor output. And so motor signals are all sent through the cerebellum and refined to be able to do uh, really fine grained stuff like muscle memory. Yep. And it's like that, it really makes you think about it, right? Because the cerebellum is an old structure. A lot of uh, organisms have cerebellums and that's what's doing a lot of their computational power a lot of their muscle memory and a lot of these things. And so you really got to think about like, what were the, the higher cognitive things in these older organisms um, and what kind of information may still be utilized in our cerebellum because of that. It's extremely hard to study with MRI uh, because of the way that it's structured, because of where it's situated. There's a lot of signal dropout in cerebellum when you're studying it on MRI uh, because of its location and uh, what surrounds it. It's just really hard to pick up reliable signals, and so it's not very well studied. So now we're moving up in the pyramid, um, and this is where you start to get away from some of those older, really simple organisms like alligators and reptiles and things like that, uh, and you start to get into more of the emotional type processing and integration type processing. This next one that we're going to talk, so diencephalon is just kind of the overarching term for these like structures that are in the middle here. Uh, it's not something I want you guys to memorize. Uh, this region, though, is something that you guys should all know, and it is going to come up a ton. The thalamus is the gateway to the cortex. This is one of the most important brain regions that we have. It's the relay station where all of your sensory information comes into the brain. There are specific nuclei, which we'll talk about in a minute, that process these different sensory inputs. Um, and this is something that we'll get back into when we talk about sensation. This is something that will be a possible test question in that lecture as well. And this is kind of just hinting at that, that all of our senses go through the thalamus except for olfaction. Olfaction has a different pathway. Olfaction is our ability to smell. So this is one of the primary sites of information gathering. Um, some people have talked about this in terms of like the binding problem. We have all of this sensory information that we're collecting, but how is it all bound together to create this perceptual experience that we have where like everything is kind of unified? Um, some people think that thalamus plays a role in that. Other people think that it requires some like higher regions, but thalamus is very important and it's organized in nuclei. Like we talked about these really dense packs of neurons and these nuclei all process different types of information. Um, this one is really important. Uh, the other ones are important too, but the LGN is a very, very well-studied portion of the visual system. And it does a lot of um, processing on its own before you even get to, to cortex. Uh, medial geniculate nucleus uh, is involved in auditory information. And then you have these ventral posterior nuclei that are involved in somatosensory type stuff. Um, there's ones in there for gustatory, for tasting, things like that. Uh, main idea here, what I really want you guys to take away, is that the thalamus is composed of nuclei. So 
Those nuclei are densely packed neurons. And those densely packed neurons, nuclei, all share functionally similar inputs, right? So you have a specific nuclei that is just processing one sense. And this is really, really important when we start to get into how sensory information is collected and processed, because you don't want the senses mixed before they're processed, right? You want to process it in its entirety, entirety and then you want to share it with the other senses. And so that's where a lot of this separation is happening. There might be some crosstalk in some of these regions, but for the most part, like it's trying to keep the signal as pure as it can in this port, in this way of looking at it. So the hypothalamus is one of the, the main communication centers with the bodily organs. Uh, this is the chief site of hormone produ pr production, right? So we talked about acetylcholine being able to activate muscle cells, but a lot of our organs don't speak that language right? They require different types of hormones to be able to get them to do different types of things. So the hypothalamus is very heavily involved in homeostasis and releasing these complex molecules that get different organs to do different things. Because of that, it's regulating things like temperature, metabolic rate, um, sexual phase, circadian rhythm, how well your immune system is regulated. Like this is extremely complicated. You could spend your entire life studying the hypothalamus, not even get close to trying to understand the complexity of like immunoregulation and these other things. Um, the pituitary gland is a very important piece of this. Uh, this is something that's really easy to pick up on MRI images actually. It's got this really uh, heavy fat spot on the, on the back, so it'll just like glow on an MRI image. But that's where a lot of this hormone produ production is happening. And the hypothalamus, again, you're seeing this <coughs> word nuclei. Right? This was this strategy that older brain structures used to organize information. And as the organisms got more complex, you start to see layers in the cortex. And that's what we're going to look at now is the telencephalon, fancy way of saying the higher portions of the brain. So we're going to start with looking at the limbic system, and then we'll kind of briefly touch on the basal ganglia, and then Cerebral cortex is where the magic happens. So if we think back to Maslow's kind of hierarchy, we were looking at physiological function and safety. And that's what a lot of these brain regions that we've just talked about have kind of encompassed, right? Making sure homeostasis is set, making sure that we're attending to and processing fear type responses so that we can engage fight or flight. Uh, and then making sure that the bodily organs are just running correctly, the heart is pumping and things like that. But these brain regions allow for a lot of flexibility, um, the ability to be social, the ability for memory to aid in, the, in what the organism does. And the first part of that is the limbic system. And so if we're working up the pyramid, the next step up is kind of emotion regulation. And that's what the limbic system is really heavily tied into. It's emotion and memory uh, kind of paving the way for the complex thing that humans are able to do. Uh, a lot of this, a lot of mammals have emotions. They have the ability to remember things. You can teach a dog things, things like that. Um, they have very intact limbic systems that allow them to do those things. Alligators are not social creatures. They don't have the ability to interact in the same way a dog does because they don't have the ability to do these kind of things that this part of the brain gives them. And so emotion is, this is kind of a fancy way of saying emotion, is that it's linking your autonomic hormonal and immunological state. So how does the body feel with how we're representing that feeling? Like the emotion is the representation, right? of I have all of these bodily inputs of how the body is, what state the body's in, and I'm gonna label that. I'm gonna have that be some kind of an emotion because different emotions feel different. If you're angry, you have different chemicals running through you. It has a different kind of profile of hormones and molecules. And that's kind of where this, this labeling is happening. Uh, memory is happening in the hippocampus. Uh, and we'll talk a lot about that in learning and memory. This is just kind of showing you where these things are located. This is the region of the brain, though, that is the most plastic. 
the most able to change and adapt. Uh, and this gave those organisms, as they got more complex, the ability to have more complex behaviors because they were able to adapt and change based on things they remembered, based on things they encountered, based on how things felt. Basal ganglia is not one you guys necessarily need to memorize. This one's really heavily involved in motor preparation and task switching. Um, we'll talk about it when we talk about action signals and producing action signals. This is a heavy target of uh, Parkinson treatment. Uh, if you ever hear of like deep brain stimulation, they're actually stimulating basal ganglia neurons. So they're having to send a wire all the way down that deep into the brain to get those neurons to fire. One of the really kind of unfortunate things with Parkinson's disease is that Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disease. That means those neurons are actually dying. And so there's a certain point where any of these treatments, giving them L-DOPA, doing deep brain stimulation isn't gonna work because there's no more neurons to stimulate, to release dopamine. Um, these are still kind of located in the, the middle in these older structures. So these are still uh, organized in nuclei, but they contain a ton of dopamine and that's why I'm bringing up Parkinson's. This is where all of it that we're able to do, the flexibility of our behaviors comes from our cerebral cortex. Um, ours is folded, some mammals have flat ones. The folded portion, let me see if I, yeah, allows for more surface area. We can pack way more neurons in if we fold it. And it also allows, so if I have a sheet of brain tissue that's flat, and then I fold it, that allows neurons that are here to directly communicate with neurons here much more efficiently. Instead of sending projections all the way over here, now they just have to send them right across this little gap. Um, these folds and these valleys and, and hills, the sulci are the folds, our sulci, the gyri are the protrusions. Um, and these distinctions were used to separate brain regions early on. So when you like if you were to take a neuroanatomy class and memorize a lot of these structures, these structures were actually identified before we were able to look at what they were doing because we were just dissecting brains and saying, okay, this looks consistent. This is its own little brain region. That worked in some cases, but you'll see as we get into MRI that it's not that straightforward. A brain region that's named something doesn't necessarily do just one thing. It does a ton of different stuff. And these are the cortical layers that I got at earlier. Uh, there's this very, very specific organization of the layers with different types of neurons. So this is a pyramidal cell right here that has tons of projections. So layer four is the input layer. That's this layer right here. This is the layer that gets all of the information from the thalamus. And then layer five, it's what's sending output back out. Uh, this isn't stuff I'm going to test you on, but it's kind of cool to look at the fact that there's this very, very specific and nuanced structure to the way that the neurons are communicating in the cortex and the way that they're organizing and sending information. Uh, these superficial la layers at the top are believed to be involved in like the higher cognitive functions. They're believed to have the most flexibility in the way that they talk to one another. And then we'll go briefly through, okay. So we, we kind of talked about this earlier. So this is this idea of the difference between gray matter and white matter. So gray matter is where all the cell bodies are. White matter is all of the connections between them. And I mentioned when we were talking about oligodendrocytes, this idea of diffusion imaging with MRI. That's what this picture is right here. These like pretty colors. It's actually mapping out all of those wires, all of those different connections between the different kinds of types of the brain. We'll talk about that when we get into methods. So there's four lobes of the cerebral cortex. You've probably heard of these before, the frontal, the parietal, occipital, and temporal. And they were actually named after the piece of skull that covered them. So when we're born, um, it's gonna be interesting when I have my new baby, because they're like, each of the brain plates is not fused when you're born. So there's a different plate over each of these different parts of the brain. And as you get older, those plates will fuse together. But those separations, are interesting because the different pieces of bone are actually covering parts of the brain that do specific types of things. 
Like the parietal cortex is involved in a very specific type of information. The occipital lobe is involved in a very specific type of information. So it's interesting that like these regions developed and then there was like specific bones that developed to protect the specific regions. I don't know. That just kind of blows my mind. Um, they have very specific sulci that separate them, right? So they've kind of isolated themselves from the other regions in a way. The first one is the occipital lobe that we'll talk about all the way in the back of the brain. And this is where the visual cortex is. Kind of ironic. We all have eyes in the back of our head. <laughs> right? And there's a lot going on before you even get there. The eyes have to travel. I mean, the information from the eyes has to travel a really long distance before it's turned into the perceptual stuff that we experience. So just know that the occipital lobe is vision. Okay? The temporal lobe is what's processing audition. That's easy to remember. It's right next to the ears, right? So it's got maps of different frequencies of sounds that we'll talk about when we get into sensation. So auditory cortex. The parietal lobe is where our somatosensation is being processed. So information about touch, information about body position, proprioception. Uh, there's actually a map of our body. You guys probably heard of the homunculus before. We'll talk a lot about that when we get into sensation as well. And the last lobe is the frontal lobe. Uh, we have the biggest frontal lobe in the animal kingdom. Um, this is where the primary <laughs> motor cortex is. And we've also looked at, there's a lot of really complicated, uh, high order cognitive functioning that happens in the frontal lobe. And we'll get into a lot of that as we go through the course. Frontal lobe is a very complex part of the brain. But the, the motor portion is actually right next to the parietal cortex. So the parietal, cor parietal cortex is kind of collecting all this information about where the body is and what the body is doing. And then there's this region right next to it. It's like, okay, that's where the body is. Let's move it. So the insula is the last one that could actually be labeled a lobe in its own. Um, it's kind of hidden back behind the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe back here. Uh, we don't have a good idea of what it does. It's located right over the sinuses, and so it has a lot of signal dropout in MRI. Uh, the sinuses produce a lot of trouble for us in trying to, met the, to measure signals with MRI. But uh, it receives a lot of emotional <laughs> input and it's right there above that limbic system right and there's a lot of people that are involved in research that are trying to link it to self stuff and awareness stuff um, i actually study the self and there's also portions of the frontal cortex that are heavily involved with that but um, we'll talk about this briefly when we talk about sensation and it might come up a, a couple of times in some other lectures but just know that it's kind of this not really well under, understood big portion of the cortex. And so kind of putting it all together, wrapping it up, um, what we'll start to go through. So the next lecture we're going to yeah, kind of putting it all together. This is going to be a very, very important image for you guys to understand when we're thinking about information flow in the brain. And what happens, because we're going to be talking a lot about cortex, so a lot of these deep brain structures are things that are not uh, heavy topics in this course. The cortex is going to be a big focus. And the cortex is organized in this way that information is first processed in these primary unimodal cortex. So you have these primary sensory areas in blue, and those are the ones that I was kind of mentioning earlier with the, the lobes. So you have the primary visual cortex, you have the primary auditory cortex, and that's where the sens sensory information is coming in first. These unimodal association areas are what are processing those senses. And so you have a visual unimodal association area that's taking basic visual information and building up perceptions, it's trying to figure out, okay, if there's a line here and a line here and a line here, that's probably a table, right? <clears throat> unimodal association areas are only processing one sense. There's not a mixing of information at this time. So we're kind of collecting these perceptual ideas about what we're seeing, about what we're feeling or smelling or touching. And then 
the unimodal areas then share their perceptions with other senses in multimodal areas. And so blue is primary, where simple sensory information is processed. Along with the blue is, are these like unimodal. They're just processing the one sense, but it's getting a lot more complicated, and they're forming like complicated perceptions. And then these multimodal, these kind of pink areas, are areas that are specific for kind of combining all that information and creating integration, integrated perceptions. So this is going to come up a lot. I want you guys to understand the flow of the information through the system. That as we collect sensory information, that information is processed in isolation, and then it's shared with the rest of the brain so we can create these integrated perceptions. And the brain is organized in two different ways. There's microcircuitry, which is these localized circuits, right? When we were talking about nuclei, a nuclei is a microcircuit. It's processing a specific type of information. But macro circuits, neural networks, are kind of the combination of these different micro circuits into the shared network of information. Uh, the brain exhibits a small world architecture. Uh, this is something that comes from uh, uh, network theory, if you're studying like social networks or things like that. Uh, small world architecture it says that the system itself, the social network, or whatever you're studying has a lot of short distance connections. So I have a lot of close friends and I have a few long distance projections. So you have these microcircuits that have a lot of connections between themselves and then those microcircuits have a few projections to other areas. And this creates neural networks. And we will talk about this later. This is just to kind of end the lecture today. And to say, we will talk about what resting state is, but resting state has allowed us to identify that these different brain regions are the ones that are talking to each other. So very specific types of <laughs> complex information is being shared and processed in these different networks. And that's what I got for you today. <laughs>